All right. Well, good evening, everybody. I'm glad you're here for Table Talk. Are we live yet? It says so. It's funny to look over here and look at this, and it, I'm, I'm just now sitting down. I'm already right. here about 10 seconds. This thing is like, it's like behind. It's funny it. to watch. So we can buzz you out when you say something wrong. Oh, when it's, a, when it's heresy, you can just stop it. <laughs> Well, welcome, everybody. Those of you that are out there in, you know, Facebook digital land, we're glad that you're here. And I got my partner, Eric, here. Eric has a, uh, he has a special interest in this lesson tonight, I think, because you guys don't know this, but, you know, he's young and everything, and he decided, <laughs> he decided to go back to school. He is actually in seminary studying, and, uh, and I was, I'm proud of you, and he's, he just, he told me about six months ago, something like that. It wasn't longer than that. I don't remember. Longer than that, yeah. He came in and he said to me, he says, you know, he says, I've been doing this lawyering thing for a long time and everything. I just want to, I just want to be more ready to serve the Lord, more ready to be used, more ready to teach, more ready. And I said, okay, good. What do you want to do? He says, I want to go to school. Okay. <laughs> so, and what are you, what are you studying right now? Apologetics, I, I think. I just finished up apologetics, yeah. Okay. So you've done Perfect already, you've done... Hermeneutics. Hermeneutics. And apologetics. And so apologe hermeneutics is uh, interpretation of Scripture, and apologetics is defense of the Scripture. And these are like really, they're like the last things you study. These are the first things he's studying. So I'm pretty impressed. So, but the reason I said that is I read a paper that he wrote on what we're going to talk about tonight. Did anybody see the little ad that I did this afternoon for this? Anybody at all see that? Yeah, um, <laughs> Michael saw it. I think, I don't know if anybody's watching those anymore, Michael. You're the only person in the room that raised your hand. I had an update and an ad for what we're doing tonight. And we're going to be talking about uh, what I'm calling the death dilemma. And it's uh, in Luke once again. We're going to go back to the book of Luke and... Uh, it's going to be in Luke chapter 16, and we're going to get to it in just a minute. Before we do, we're so glad that you all are here, and it does seem like a few people are start, starting to creep back actually on campus on Wednesday night, and we're glad for that, and uh, we're praying that God would uh, just take this COVID thing and do away with it so that we just quit talking about it, you know. I, I can't wait till it's not the top of the news, you know what I mean? And so, I mean, I got a sneaking suspicion it's going to be much less news after the 3rd of November. I don't think it's going to be as big of news after that. I'm just being suspicious. But uh, we need to, there's a lot of people still getting sick with this. And, and uh, I know this is totally unimportant and not, uh, you know, I mean, he's no more important than anybody else. But I, I did think it was interesting that, Luke, uh, that uh, uh, Nick Saban, coach of the University of Alabama, has COVID. He found out this afternoon. And so... Now maybe they'll get beat this week in the ball game. That'd be cool. Well, anyway, so <laughs> not by Tennessee. Tennessee's not going to beat anybody. Trust me. <laughs> so, so anyway, let's uh, let's start tonight with a word of prayer and uh, ask the Lord to be with us. We're going to talk about the death dilemma, the story of the rich man and Lazarus. For those of you that have not been tuning in on Facebook or you haven't been here on Wednesday night, we've been talking about what I'm calling the startling stories of Jesus, the parables. And um, it's been a, just a great time for me. I've learned a lot, and uh, I think we have all uh, been gaining a lot from it. So let's just go to the Lord in prayer and ask Him to be with us tonight. And, um, and then Eric's going to kind of introduce the story to us. Father, we thank You for the time that You've given us uh, to come together tonight. Thank You for live stream. Thank You for Facebook. Thank You for the tools that You've given us to get beyond the walls of the church, uh, especially, Lord, during a time when there are still those that have underlying conditions are not able to get out as much as they would like. I pray this would be a blessing. And then for those that are here gathered with us, I pray our interaction tonight and uh, this time of table talk would be a blessing. And uh, Lord, we love you. And uh, we are just, uh, we, are, we are thankful to be in your family, thankful that we have been forgiven of our sins. And the subject tonight, perhaps the most straightforward and serious of any of the lessons that we've had up to this point, I pray, Father, that you would use it. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. So, Eric, you know, why don't you, I know you have studied this one a lot, so why don't you just give us an intro on what we're going to talk about here a little bit. All right. As uh, Phil said, this is the story of the rich man and Lazarus. Uh, we uh, joined Jesus pretty much at the height of his ministry. He's uh, uh, wandering from uh, town to town and uh, drawing huge crowds wherever he goes. And part of the crowd is always the uh, Pharisees and the scribes and the other religious elites. 
that are trying to uh, figure out just who this guy is and what he's about, and then he starts uh, saying things about them that he, that they don't like. No, so, especially this stuff about money. Yeah, yeah. He's been talking about money, parable after parable after parable. He's talking about money's not the answer. Watch out, money will become your god. And what they reacted to that, didn't they? Oh, they sure did, and they they changed from trying to figure out who he was to trying to get rid of him. Yeah. So yeah. You know, there was a degree of rivalry, I think, sometimes that we miss. We miss this, we miss this point. Jealousy was, uh, Pilate said it himself. He said at the end, whenever the Jews, the, the, the Sadducees, the Pharisees, basically the Sanhedrin, which is the ruling, the ruling group of the Jews, when they delivered Jesus up and wanted him to be crucified, uh, the Bible said he worked all day trying to deliver him because he knew that they had delivered him up for crucifixion out of envy. They were envious of him. So what were they envious of? Well, it's pretty obvious. He had huge crowds oh. following him. Uh, he was able to do bona fide miracles. They, were, uh, they, they could not poke any holes in what he was saying. They tried to convince the people that he was breaking the law, breaking the Sabbath, they tried and tried. They just couldn't do it. And then every once in a while, they would try to catch him in, catch him in his words. That didn't work out very well. He, um, you know, they've been trying to catch this uh, lady, this, uh, the one oh, that the, they're interviewing, Amy, Amy Barrett. Yeah, Barrett. They've been trying to catch her in her words. They hadn't done very well with her either. But, I mean, to try to do that with Jesus is just absolutely impossible. Well, it's been a tremendous blessing, this study. We've spoken on all of these parables. I've never done this before where I did them all in a series. I've just taken them as they've come, but we've been doing them in a series. And um, I have heard people say from time to time uh, that, well, you know, speaking of preachers, you know, I really like that church over there, but that preacher, all he does is tell stories. <laughs> Think about what we're reading and studying right now. What is Jesus doing? Every time he wants to drive home a point or illustrate something, he tells a story. Sometimes they're just plain stories, and then sometimes there are these parables. And uh, sometimes the parables confuse the listeners, and sometimes the parables make it much more understandable. Uh, in fact, sometimes he gave parables in order that the people listening could not understand because they had such hard hearts he didn't want them to hear it. But then the people who wanted to know and really trusted him, they did understand. So we've seen all kinds of them. We talked about the understanding father, talked about loving our neighbor. We talked about gratitude. Uh, we've talked about how forgiven people forgive people. That's a very, very important concept um, where the one man had been forgiven, you know, the 10,000 talents, but he didn't want to forgive somebody 100 talents. He was forgiven an insurmountable debt, but he didn't want to forgive somebody else a very small debt comparatively. And uh, Jesus was not happy with him. And, of course, he gave this story to illustrate that because Peter had said, how many times should I forgive my brother? Should I do it seven times? Which seven, number of completion, and Jesus says, no, not seven times, but 70 times seven. In other words, you, you, we have to have a forgiving spirit. And forgiven people forgive people. That was a big one. We talked about moving from attachment to commitment. That is giving up everything and putting it on the altar for the Lord. Then last week, we finished up with the parable. Uh, no, not last week, two weeks ago, the handling of our possessions, the parable of the rich fool. That was a guy that had a lot, and he got a whole lot more, and he didn't want to share it. He had some big barns, though. <laughs> he did have some impressive <laughs> barns. And, um, and then uh, we talked about being a discerning disciple. Again, it's about money, and it was the parable of the shrewd manager. And what did we say the word shrewd? We, it sometimes has a negative connotation, but in this parable it didn't. What was the idea of shrewd? Somebody tell me. Wise, discerning. He was... He, he, he was uh, he was wise in the sense of he was planning for the future. And uh, it's a foolish thing not to plan for the future, even if you're talking about earthly things, but especially spiritual things. And so uh, now we're going to come to this one, this one tonight. It follows right on the heels of the one about the shrewd manager, and it's the story of the rich man and Lazarus. Lazarus was a very poor man, and the story contrasts their life on earth and their destinies after death. It's interesting. We're going to read the story in just a minute. You got, the, got it printed yeah, out? Or you I've got, got it? it ready. Okay. I did, I did want to just okay. kind of set the stage a little bit more. All right. Go for it. Jesus just told a, a bunch of parables in a row. Yep. And uh, three of them prior to this parable were the, uh, the lost coin, mm -hmm. the widow and the lost coin, and the lost sheep, mm -hmm. and the lost son. Yeah. 
And all of them had to do with these, these people or these things that we may not think have a, should have a whole lot of importance, have importance to God. Yeah. And now we come to hmm. the rich man and Lazarus. And poor Lazarus, nobody, nobody thought much of him because uh, he right. was just a beggar yeah. uh, laying at the gate, yeah. full of sores. He's not worth our worry. Mm. Well, Jesus oh. straightened him out on that. Well, and, and when he died, how many people would have missed him? Well, he, I mean, now the rich man, you know, he's going to die in this story. And I can just imagine the, you know, the funeral that happened for him. I mean, I don't know if you guys ever watched the old English movies and everything where they have these, these, the mourners that walk in front of those caskets and there's the guys with the big tall hats and the feathers and the black hearse and everybody's big procession. I picture something like that with this guy. Everybody knew when the rich guy died and they, I mean, he's probably buried in some big you know, mausoleum or tomb with a great stone or something. Probably but, able to hire a lot of mourners too. Yeah. And they, yeah, exactly. They did that in those yeah. days. And so, I mean, you remember when the little girl or when, uh, when Lazarus, who Jesus raised from the dead, when he died, there were all kinds of hired mourners there. And when Jesus said, move the stone, everybody laughed and mocked, you know, and we did the same thing with raising of Tabitha. So interesting. So uh, we're going we're gonna to talk about this, but before we read that, let me read this. There's a death fixation today. We live in a society that has a fixation on death. In fact, the sting of death is increasingly being dismissed. Uh, we hear these kinds of phrases, death with dignity, uh, determining your exit, uh, dying so that you can live again, pointing to the idea of reincarnation. You know, popular music and Hollywood movies and society itself seems to be increasingly rejecting the idea that death is something negative or something to avoid. I even hear this. Sometimes I hear pastors at funerals say, death is a part of life. Now, maybe you're sitting there and you're saying, well, isn't it? I mean, everybody dies. Death's part of life. I want to say that, that nothing could be further from the truth. Death is the antithesis of life. Death is not the original plan of God for mankind. Death was the result of sin and the rejection of God's plan for man. Death is the consequence of disobedience. It's so important. It couldn't be further from the truth. The Bible says in Romans 6, 23, for the wages of sin is death. And then uh, it says death holds people in fear all of their lives. That's Hebrews 2, 15. And then this is the, this is the kicker right here. 1 Corinthians 15, 26 says, death is the last enemy that will be destroyed. And so death is no friend. We've got no business making, a, making friends with death in our life. Now, if we want to say this, that, that we can say that death is inevitable, oh yeah, that's very true. It's appointed unto men and women how many times to die? One time. We're going to face God after we die, but it's important to understand it's appointed unto us once to die and after this the judgment. But that doesn't mean we have an anticipatory longing for death. No, no, no. Death is not a friend. And it's so much for us to understand. So God didn't create death in the seven days of creation. He's the author of life, not death. And so we're, gonna, we're going to look into this tonight and see why this is so very important. Uh, let's read the passage that speaks of these two destinies of people. They're going to pass through the portal of death. I personally take this story to be true. It has been called a parable, and it may be a parable, but it's the first story and the only one, if it is a parable, in which he mentions a man by name, and the man he mentions is Lazarus. And so he just got done talking about the, the, the fight between money or mammon, which is like a god, and him, the fight between God and money or the way that we look at it. We left off talking about how we cannot serve God and money, and, uh, and now we're going to see about one of these men who really had a whole lot of money, and we're going to see what it was about. So let's read the story. Go All for right. it. This is the rich man and Lazarus. You'll find that in Luke 16, 19 to 31. Now there was a rich man, and he habitually dressed in purple and fine linen, joyously living in splendor every day. And a poor man named Lazarus was laid at his gate, covered with sores and longing to be fed with the crumbs which were falling from the rich man's table. Besides, even the dogs were coming and licking his sores. Now the poor man died and was carried away by the angels to Abraham's bosom, and the rich man also died and was buried. In Hades, he lifted up his eyes, being in torment, and saw Abraham far away and Lazarus at his bosom. And he cried out and said, Father Abraham, 
have mercy on me and send Lazarus so that he may dip the tip of his finger in water and cool off my tongue, for I am in agony in this flame. But Abraham said, Child, remember that during your life you received your good things, and likewise Lazarus bad things. But now he is being comforted here, and you are in agony. And besides all this, between us and you there is a great chasm fixed, so that those who wish to come over here to you will not be able, and that none may cross over from there to us. And he said, Then I beg you, Father, that you send him to my father's house, for I have five brothers, in order that he may warn them, so that they will not also come to this place of torment. But Abraham said, They have Moses and the prophets. Let them hear them. But he said, No, Father Abraham. But if someone goes to them from the dead, they will repent. But he said to him, If they do not listen to Moses and the prophets, they will not be persuaded, even if someone rises from the dead. It is an astounding story. An astounding parable in the Scriptures. Speaking of the two destinies... When I was doing the, uh, you didn't see it today, and so I had a, I had a quarter that I took in my hand, and uh, Dean and I were sitting at a table, and I, I was flipping this quarter, and just kept catching it and everything. Dean's looking at me, I said, Dean, what do you notice about this quarter? He said, well, I don't know, is this a trick question? I said, no. I said, how many sides does it have? He still says, is this a trick question? I said, no. It has two sides. There's just two. There's this side, there's that side, there's no more, there's no less. And I said, I, I've got to talk, about, talk tonight about not two sides of a quarter, but the two destinies of all people. There's just two. There's heaven and there's not heaven. There's heaven and hell, and those are the two destinies. We're going to talk about it from the Scriptures, and that's what this passage of Scripture, we've been talking about the love of money, we've been talking about, you know, stewardship, we've been talking about all of these things, big barns, and investing, and wasting your life, and with all kinds of incredible parables. But now, we really come to one that really is a, it's a showstopper. Uh, we come to this one. I think I should draw our attention to this. Why I think Jesus jumped to this parable is look at verse 14 of chapter 16. After he'd been talking about all these problems with money and how easy it is to make a God out of money, in verse number 14 of chapter 16, it says this. Uh, It says, now the Pharisees who were lovers of money also heard all these things and they derided him. It's no way of saying they ridiculed and mocked Jesus. They didn't want anybody to believe what he was saying because they loved money. Now get this, they were religious leaders and they loved money. Fathom that, that there are actually people in the world that use religion as a fountain to make themselves wealthy. Uh, you know, I'm, 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 I'm saying that sort of tongue in cheek because in this world today, all you got to do is turn on the television, turn on the radio and look long enough and you're going to find a lot of hucksters and charlatans and false teachers that'll say anything and do anything and tell people just what they want to hear in order to make sure that the offerings get higher and higher. So important for us to see that these Pharisees were the forerunners of all of that. They loved money and so they couldn't stand for this teaching and they did everything they could to stop it. Now there is something that we need to understand. First century Jews assumed that material wealth was the sign of God's approval in a person. You've got plenty of money, and if everything's going, if you're healthy, wealthy, and wise, and that's because God approves of everything you're doing. You are great, and you are wonderful, and God approves of you, and that's the way they thought. You must be doing something right, they thought, because look how God is blessing you. You know, it wasn't something that just first century Jews in general had. Even Jesus' disciples had a degree of this. And let me read from Matthew 10, 24. This is astonishing as well. In Matthew 10, 24, and Jesus was talking about these things, and he said to the disciples, they were astonished at his words, but Jesus answered and said, children, speaking to the disciples, how hard it is for those who trust in riches to enter the kingdom of God. It is easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for a rich man to enter the kingdom of God. And look at, listen to verse 26, and they, his disciples, were astonished. When he said that it's easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than it is for a rich man to enter the kingdom of God. Now, there's been all kinds of 
silly explanations that the eye of a needle was a small doorway in the wall of the city and if a camel got down on his knees there is no history of that story anywhere in any antiquity Josephus says nothing Tacitus says nobody that's a creation it's talking about the impossibility of a camel going through the eye of the thing that you sew with that's what it's talking about Well, you say, well, it's just impossible. Well, he goes on to say, with men this is impossible, but all things are possible with God. He's not saying that that rich people can't be saved and come to the kingdom of God. He's saying that it's very unlikely. Why? Because do rich people trust in their money more, or do they trust in God? That's exactly right. So here's what we've got here. So the, the disciples were greatly astonished. And you say, well, how did they react? They said this. Who then can be saved? So their assumption was, just like everybody else, well, these, these wealthy people, they're, they're already in good shape. I mean, God's already accepted them. We just need to be working on the people that don't have anything because they're the lost people. I had a, a deacon in our church. He was the chairman of the deacons in Maryland, and his name was Jim, and that's all I'll say. But uh, Jim told the story about how he sh- wanted to share his gospel with his brother, who was a heart surgeon. And Jim, was a, he worked at the University of Delaware, and, and he was way high up in there. And he wanted to share Christ with his brother. And he went to talk to him, and he said, listen. He said, uh, he said man, I, I want to share the gospel. And so his brother says, okay, tell me. And he told him the whole gospel about sin and about salvation. He told him about Jesus dying on the cross and his propitiation. That is atoning sacrifice for our sins and how he t- took our sins away, took away the impediment from being in God's family, and that if he would believe in him, and his brother leaned forward and put his hands on his legs, and he says, you know, Jim, he said, that is a wonderful story for those folks who need it. But as you can see, I have a good education and a good job, and I'm doing well for myself. I just, I don't have any need for anything like that. But that's a good story. You go out and tell these people that are destitute and hungry and, and, and need all the, you tell them that, and they'll, they need it. As if he had his eternity bought and paid for by his education and his big house and his fine car. Boy, it's... So prominent. He probably had a really big garage. He for did. His cars. Yeah, and he had a bigger one every time he buy like yeah. the barns, the bigger barns. Exactly. Yeah. So that's the way that, that it worked. And so even the disciples had this thought in their mind. And so I want us to look at this. Let, we read the story. Now let's look at the earthly conditions of these two men. And I want you to notice these contrasts. The rich man, what did he have? Well, he had a splendid house, he had spectacular clothing. Nobody could dress like him. He had sumptuous, the old King James said he fared sumptuously every day. I always got a kick out of the way it said that. Man, he ate really well. He had the best of everything, the best foods money could buy, and he ate that way every day of his life. Now, if we were saying it today, we'd say it something like this. He slept on satin sheets. He had a golden spoon in his mouth. He lived in a luxury home, and he had a very extravagant lifestyle, including vacations and yachts. I mean, this is the kind of guy he was. He was, quote, unquote, loaded. He had everything you wanted and plenty of it. So that was this guy. And, now he had, we, and he also had a big fence around his property with a very ornate gate. And he kept undesirables out. That's right. And one of them that he kept out was Lazarus. Lazarus. So the poor man, we know what his name is. His name is Lazarus. The poor man had no home. He was a beggar. He was laid daily at the gate of the rich man in hopes of getting crumbs that fell from his table. I need to give you a little first century information here about that. The crumbs that fell from the table, they didn't have utensils like spoons and forks and things like that that you sat down at the table and ate with. Literally, everything was put on the table and you used a piece of bread to pick up and eat, whether it was meat or vegetables or whatever. You'd take a piece of bread and you'd fold it and you'd grab it and eat it. And sometimes when they do that, they get tired of eating all the bread, they would just throw it on the floor under the table. So there was always crumbs under the table at the homes of people like that. Uh, and uh, you remember there was uh, uh, that there were uh, there were dogs usually would show up and the dogs would get those crumbs. We learned that uh, in the story of the Sidonian woman. You remember the story of the woman that came to Jesus and she had a demon possessed daughter and she said uh, lived in Sidon and she said, uh, "Please heal my daughter." And he says, "Nope, it's not right. It's not right to take the bread for the children and give it to the dogs, calling her a dog." And then she said. Yes, but even the dogs eat the crumbs from under the table. In other words, she says, just give me the crumbs. 
Or in other words, please heal my daughter. And he loved her faith and he healed her daughter. But that's the idea. So when this guy is laying at the gate and he's starving to death, he cannot even get anybody to bring him what they were using to hold their food and throwing under the table. He couldn't even get that. It tells you how poor this guy was. Also, in being laid at the gate, what we see is, is he, w- he was either an invalid or he was too weak to get there on his own. In addition, he was covered with sores and uh, he was too weak to shoo the dogs away. It says that the dogs licked his sores. So this is a pathetic, pathetic, pathetic situation. And that was a tremendous insult back then, too, to have dogs as your companions. Yeah. No, these aren't pets. Yeah. They're yeah, not pets. No, no. <laughs> the, the, the dogs are mongrels, and they are just the street animals, and they're always there picking up whatever people threw out. And that's, that was what was happening. These dogs were licking the drainage from his sores. I lived for 13 years in Peru and South America, and I've seen scenes like this. I have seen people. I will never forget this little lady in Huaraz, Peru. When I was in the mountains one day, and we had been on a mountain trek, and I came back, and there was a lady that was gro- grossly deformed, grossly deformed, had things, knots growing out of her head, and she was sitting there, and she was blind, and she was begging, and I mean, I, 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 it broke my heart to the point I couldn't hardly, I couldn't hardly function. I was trying to, uh, is, is there nothing can be done for this woman? And so this one man came up that was her handler and says, get away from her, leave her alone. He says, she's well taken care of. And I said, what do you mean well taken care of? She has everything she needs. He was using her because of her pitiful situation as a way to get money, and people would give her money, he would feed her, and then he would take the money. Of course, I was infuriated, and I wanted to do something physical to the guy, but I knew I wasn't supposed to do that. But I, 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 I can see this man. I can see this man, this invalid, laid at the gate of the rich man, and his name was Lazarus. So, um, the notable thing is, is that the rich man could not avoid seeing and knowing the state of the poor man. It's like the class system in India today. Even today in India, the, you never help anybody in these situations because, you know, they're, gonna, they're, they're paying for their past life sin right now. And, and then in the reincarnation, maybe they'll get enough of their sins paid for. They'll be doing better in their next life. It's, I mean, it's just these crazy thoughts coming. So they justify doing nothing to help people in these destitute situations. The wealth and poverty of the two characters is striking. And that's the first thing we think of. And we think as we read the story and find that the poor man went to heaven and the rich man went to the other place, he went to hell, we make the assumption that, well, he was just so poor he deserved to go to heaven. And the rich man was so, so greedy he deserved to go to hell. If you think that, you miss the whole story. That's not the teaching of this story. And let's look at it and see what it says. Uh, the men were certainly on opposite poles of affluence and misery. We might pity Lazarus. By the way, his name, interestingly, means, get this, uh, his name means God is my helper. Interesting. Lazarus. Uh, And so we might be tempted to make a villain out of the rich man because he was rich and to make a hero out of the poor man because he was poor. But if we do that, we're missing something. And I want you to see this in the story. Let's look a little deeper. Now what we're going to do is turn the tables and we're going to consider their eternal destination. What we saw was their earthly situation. One was extremely wealthy and unconcerned. One was extremely poor and unaided. I mean, that's what we see. We see that in the story and our our heart of pity goes out and it should to Lazarus. And our heart of, you know, desiring to shame the rich man, we should. I mean, we're not wrong in that, but here's what I want us to see. Lazarus goes first this time. Look at it, look at it if you would. It says, it says in verse 22, Now it came about that the poor man died, and he was carried away by the angels to Abraham's bosom. And the rich man also died and was buried. So uh, we look at Lazarus. The conventional wisdom was that misery on earth meant God's disapproval in heaven. That was the conventional wisdom. This is what everybody thought in the first century. Well, that poor guy there, he, man, he must have been terrible in a past life, or his parents were terrible, or he's done some terrible things. He's suffering for it. That's what they thought. Can you think of an Old Testament example of anything like that? Somebody thought somebody, who was it? Job. 
What did his three friends come and tell him? They were so-called friends. They came and said to Job, what do you need to do? Job, you need to repent, repent of your terrible sin. Job says, I don't know what you're talking about. I, I, this came right out of the blue. I have no, no clue why I'm in all these shit. They were convinced this is still strong. They're still believing it in the first century. I dare say today there's a lot of people who think the same thing. If you were living right, you wouldn't have all these problems. I hear this all the time. Well, I mean, you know, sometimes we apply that when people lose their jobs or this, that, or the other. But please don't say that to somebody who just heard the doctor say cancer. If you were living right, you wouldn't have cancer. No, no, no. But be careful. That is not a biblical statement to make. And so it's so important. So Lazarus, now, as we look at it, he was carried by angels to Abraham's side. An old way of saying Abraham's bosom, that means to his chest. There's another picture of this in the New Testament. John, at the Last Supper, whenever he was asking the question, you know, who is it that's going to betray you? What did it say he did? He leaned over on Jesus. He was the one that was leaning on Jesus at the table. It's the same picture. So here's what you have. You have Lazarus carried by angels to Abraham's side. Now, I want to pause and say something about this story. This story is given not to establish the location or exact conditions in heaven or hell, but to show the contrast between the two. That one is a place of extreme blessing and the other is a place of extreme horror. That is something that we need to see. And so Lazarus' arrival to Abraham's bosom or by his side would have been a place of great honor. So who was Abraham? Somebody tell me. Who was Abraham in the Bible? Well, he's a friend of God, but he was also the father. The father of the faith. The father of the faith, the father of the faithful. He is the first Jew. He's the one from whom all of the rest He had a son named Isaac, who had a son named Jacob, who had 12 sons, who built up the house of Israel. And it was through the Jews, it was through Israel that the Messiah came. I mean, this is an important figure in the Old Testament. I mean, the two most venerated people, maybe three, most venerated people in the Old Testament were Moses, Abraham, and David. These are your big names. And the, the, in the New Testament, the Jews, especially these people, love to refer to Moses and to Abraham. And so when he said in this story to all of these disciples, all of these non-disciples, all of these Pharisees, Pharisees, this poor man, and did the Pharisees like the poverty? Did they like to be poor? Did they think poverty could show any relationship with God whatsoever? No. When he said angels came and escorted him from the gate of the rich man's house when he died to the presence of God in heaven, but specifically sitting beside Abraham. What a place of honor. And just imagine the Pharisees when they're hearing that one. What? What? How dare this, what? this, this rotten rag be able to go? I mean, they, they would have thought, you know what they would have thought? Now Abraham's contaminated in heaven, right? <laughs> That's what the first thing they would have thought. Oh, he's broke. He, maybe, I don't know what's going on, but he sur- certainly can't be uh, pure in heaven anymore. So he took him to this place of honor. And so uh, we read in verse 25, it says in verse number 25, he is comforted. And you are in agony, speaking to the, to, the, to the man that went to hell. So he was in comfort. He was not in agony anymore. He wasn't suffering. It's a beautiful picture for us. No matter what our situation on earth, if we belong to God and go to heaven, there's no more agony, no more suffering, no more pain, no more tears. So important. Now let me go on. So this is describing, very important for you to understand this story. This is describing what happened specifically to Lazarus, not what will happen to us. You say, well, wait a minute. I thought when believers die, we also go to heaven. We do, but we don't go to Abraham's bosom. We go into the presence of Jesus. The Bible says in 2 Corinthians chapter 4 and 5, the first part of the verse, to be absent from the body is to be present with the So I, you know, I, you know, praise God for Abraham, but it's not, I don't want to go sit with Abraham in heaven. I want to go see Jesus, don't you? And this is what the Bible teaches. So this is a story of contrast. And by the way, this is happening before the resurrection of Jesus. There was a place called paradise. Uh, I don't want to get too much into a lot of explanation on this, but before the resurrection of Jesus, people who believed, people who were the faithful, died and went to Hades, but to the, there were two compartments. There was one that was called paradise, or Abraham's bosom, where the faithful and the ones that loved God went, and then there was the place 
in Hades that was the place of torment, which is where this man went. And there was a great chasm, a gulf, a huge space fixed in between. And they couldn't go from one place to the other. But Jesus, when he died, the Bible says in Ephesians chapter 4, he went down into that place and he led those that were in that paradise. He led them then into the presence of God. This, this place, Abraham's bosom, paradise, as it is, it doesn't exist anymore. Because to die today means we go to be in the Lord's presence. Now, the place of punishment still exists, but not the place called paradise. If we say paradise now, we mean to be in the Lord's presence in heaven. So, why, here comes the question, why was Lazarus welcomed into heaven? Was it because he was poor? Could that possibly be the reason that God welcomed him? All poor people go to heaven. Is that a Bible doctrine? No. No. Now, he was welcomed into heaven on another basis, but it's not clearly talked about concerning him, but it's understood when we understand why the rich man didn't go to heaven. And so we're going to see it, and let me go on. So let's, now then, we've looked at Lazarus, what happened to him. He was carried by angels to Abraham's side. He was in a place of comfort. And now let's talk about the rich man. He died, and he was buried. Let's read that verse. <laughs> it's kind of amazing how it's written. 22, it says, now, it came about that the poor man died, and he was carried away by the angels to Abraham's bosom, or to Abraham's side. And the rich man also died and was buried. So, I, I mean, I, I doubt that, I, who knows what they did with, with, uh, with Lazarus' body. I mean, he thrown in potter's field. I mean, I don't know, they throw him over there and throw some broken pottery over him. What did they do? But the rich man, he was buried. I get the idea that, you know, they went through all the rigmarole with him, and it would have been a big process, and he would have paid the mourners, just as we said a little bit ago. So he was buried. Sounds fatal. Sounds final. Sounds like that's the end of it. There are so many people in the world. I heard one of the mockers the other day on the radio, just, just it was a sports figure, just laughing about the idea that there's life beyond death. Because they think when they're dead, they're buried, that's it. When you're dead, you're dead like a dog's dead, and there's nothing beyond, beyond that. But look at verse number 23. And in Hades he lift up his eyes, being in torment, and saw Abraham afar away, and Lazarus in his bosom, and he cried. Send mercy, have mercy, send Lazarus, that he may dip the tip of his finger in water and cool my tongue, for I am in agony in this. What does it say? What's that last word? I'm in agony in this what? Flame. Now, we live in a society that's just, you know, we're highly developed and highly educated. We've grown beyond all myth and legend. Uh, we don't believe in the Greek mythology and all that. And so certainly we can't believe that the Bible still teaches that uh, God would be a God who would have a place for the devil and his angels, plus all who reject him, that literally is a place of punishment, would he? I mean, could that even exist? You see, that's the world we live in. Maybe you're even here tonight and you're thinking, wow, this is... This is amazing. I mean, you mean the Bible actually says something so draconian? That's the new word today. Everybody, right? Everything's draconian. You know, if it's terrible, it's draconian. I don't know why they say that. Well, what we've got right here in this passage is, is that God says the words flowing off of Jesus' own lips are, He died, and in Hades, He lift up His eyes in torment, and He said, send me some relief. I am suffering in this flame. Wow. So he's in a place of, and I want you to get listen to this word. What does the Bible teach about this? Let's get this now. He died and he was buried. He made no provision for his soul. He was just like the rich fool with the big barns. All of his preparation was for here and now. He had made no preparation for eternity. He died and he went to Hades. He was in torment. I he, think it's important here, Phil, to understand that the word for torment is torture. Mm -hmm. So we're looking at eternal torture. That's it is, what a, is facing a torturous place. He could see the blessing of Lazarus. Imagine just the torture of that. He saw Lazarus by, by sitting beside Abraham afar off, and he's thinking, what in the world is going? I mean, that beggar, that guy at my gate, I mean, how could this be? And look, at, look what I mean. He's weeping and crying, and how could this be? And there he is. There's Lazarus up there. You know, I just, you know, I picture him, you know, fanning him and putting grapes in his mouth. I don't know. I'm just, I'm just, I'm seeing this incredible difference. 
So he could see the blessing of Lazarus. It's too bad he didn't have better sight when he was on earth to be able to see the poverty of Lazarus and to be able to care and help. He didn't care. Now, on this point of Hades, the grave, that's what the word means. The literal translation of the word Hades is the grave, the place of the dead. In the Old Testament, there was another word. It was the word Sheol. And uh, it was used, but it's the same thing. It means the place of the dead. There's another word in the, New, in the New Testament. It's the word Gehenna, Gehenna, or Valley of Hinnom, or Gehenna. And it means the place of eternal burning, <coughs> Gehenna. You say, well, how do you know that? Well, because there was the Valley of Hinnom on the southeast side of Jerusalem. And I think you've probably even seen it because you've been there. There was a valley that, that in, in order to get rid of the refuse, get rid of the, you know, the things humans need to get rid of, they carried it outside of the city, and there was a perpetual fire that never went out. The smoke was always burning, and they were always burning the refuse of all things. It was outside the city. And so Gehenna, that's that word. That's another word for the place of the dead. Gehenna, the, the place of burning. And then the word that's most often used, you can guess what that word is in the Bible. What's the place of punishment, the place of the lost that's most often used. What is it? Lake of fire. Hell. It's the word hell, eventually lake of fire, but the word hell. Ultimately, lake of fire is the place for the dead, that is those that do not have life. Now here's some terrifying facts as we finish this up tonight. Here are the terrifying facts. You say, man, you know, what is this? Because Halloween is coming, you're trying to tell scary stories? No. <laughs> Hasn't got anything to do with that. I mean, it's just the next parable in line. And, uh, you know, I mean, the temptation is just skip stuff that's hard like this and just, you know, you know tell, me, tell me about John 3, 16, for God so loved the world that he gave his only son. <laughs> tell me about that. You know, well, amen, we will. We'll tell you, I'll tell you my favorite verse in the whole Bible. The verse that impacted my life, the one that rules my life, the one that, that, that it's, like a, it's like a rudder on my ship, and that's this one. It's Romans 5, 8, that God proved his love toward us in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. That's it. That's, my, that's the rudder for my ship in my life. He loved me so much, I am not going to let my life go by without returning the love for him. I'm going to live according to the sacrificial love of Jesus, but... <laughs> I, can't, I, would be, I would be remiss, I would be an irresponsible teacher and preacher to not teach what's in the Bible when it comes up. And here we come to this passage of Scripture, the parable of the rich man and Lazarus, and here are the facts. The facts are these. Hell is real. Yes. Hell is real. G did you know this? Did you know that Jesus spoke more of hell than any other person in the Scriptures? Let me give you an example. Matthew 10, 28, Jesus off of his own lips, do not fear those who kill the body, but cannot kill the soul, but rather fear him who is able to destroy both soul and body in hell. That's Jesus talking. And it goes on and on. So hell is real. Next, next point. This is right out of this story. Bible doctrine. Hell is horrible. You know, these, I, I don't want to use, I, I pity the people. But the rock music people way back in the 60s writing songs, Highway to Hell, bragging about this, singing songs about it, having a death fixation, making movies about it, heaven for climate, hell for company, these kinds of things. Hell isn't a joke. Hell isn't a concept. Hell, I hear it all the time. Hell is right here on this. I've heard people say, I've been living through hell my whole life. You have no idea what you're saying. You do not know. You say, well, do people suffer today? Absolutely. This man suffered. Lazarus suffered. People suffer. Go to the hospital. Go to any, any of these long-term, terminally ill homes where people are. And see the suffering because of cancer, because of ailments. My daughter is working in a prison in Kansas right now, Amber. Uh, and it just seemed like my whole family all of a sudden has gotten in prison ministry. It's amazing. Bonnie, Sherry, <laughs> Amber. Bonnie be, is too. Huh? I'll be, yeah, Bonnie's out in Mitchellville. I'll be the next one to go to jail, I'm sure. So. <laughs> But Amber, she, she said that she had gone through some training out there, and they took her to this men's prison. They said, we want you to see the full underbelly of everything. And she went into some places. Dad, she says, Daddy, what I saw was unspeakable. And what I saw men doing to themselves 
in these cells, beating their heads on the floor until they were bleeding. He said, the things that I saw, the screams, the yell, the blood curdling. He says, I cannot describe it to you. She says, all I wanted to do was just scream, Jesus, please help them. There's a book out there that describes the uh, uh, experience of hell, uh, 23 Minutes in Hell by Bill Weiss. And uh, he goes into some great detail of a vision that he had. Mm. And, uh, and uh, it's really, really grabs you. If you want to know what hell is like, uh, he gives you all the biblical references. Mm. And mm. Uh, it's, it's very excellent, compelling. The rich man is not annihilated or unconscious. That's another false teaching. Um, hell is horrible. He is in agony. He is in flames. And he is crying for a drop of water. There's all kinds of things that are being revealed here in this story. I'll give you something else. Hell is final. Uh, there's a great gulf fixed. Uh, his location and eternity is fixed. Uh, this great gulf. I, I, I can picture this. I've trekked through the Andes in, the, in, the, in Peru on many occasions. And I've... I've walked along the Andes, and we'll, you know, we'll, 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 we'll think we're going. The, the guide would tell us, okay, we're going to hit these two villages, and we're going to go around the edge of this mountain, and then we're just going to go right over there, and there's going to be another point, and that's where we're going to be camping tonight. And I'd say, oh, boy, this is great. It won't be long. And so we go over there, and all of a sudden I look, and here's this great 6,000, 8,000 feet down gulf, and there's no way to get over there except to walk all the way back Follow the, follow the valley all the way till you can get across. Come all the way back. And I want to go right there. And if I can almost throw a rock and hit it, but it's impossible. There's this great gulf, and you got to go all the way down there. But, I mean, in hell, there's no place to go down there and get around. There's this chasm. No bridge. No bridge. And then finally, hell is forever. Now, here's what people like to get philosophical. Wait, 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 wait. Hell is forever. Now, wait a minute. How could a loving God sentence someone to eternal punishment? Here's the question. You're going to hear it. How could a loving God sentence someone to eternal punishment for time-based offenses and sins? They only live 70, 80, 90 years. How could God justify? We make the terrible mistake of assuming that once people die and are cast into hell, that they immediately, either they're destroyed immediately, which is a fallacy. I can give you verses all night long on that one. Or number two, that they immediately repent and they just, they're sorry that they're in that place and, and God would never just keep on punishing them once they have realized the error of the way. The Bible teaches just the opposite. The Bible says the one, let the sinner be a sinner still. It's talking about that when they go to hell, they don't fall in love with God when they start suffering the punishment of their sin. They don't all of a sudden repent in hell. They confess with their mouth that he is God, but they don't repent and they don't say, oh man, I made the wrong choice. I, I'm, the truth is I really love God. God, I really, they don't do that. They're in flames and they curse and they hate God and they blaspheme for eternity and the sin goes on and the punishment goes on. The hell is forever. Now, I'm talking to people out there in Facebook land that you're probably, some of you may be gritting your teeth and thinking, you know, what kind of God is this? Man, I'm, I'm, this is what it says. And I, and Eric, I think one of the big problems is we don't understand. We do not understand as humans what an offense to God, a three-time holy God our rebellion and sin and hate and envy and murder and rape and lust and theft. We do not understand that our rejection of him, what kind of a offense that is to God. Yeah. Jesus tried to explain it on the Sermon on the Mount. He did. That but we don't understand it. And boy, and you know, the saddest thing about this whole story is the Bible says that hell was prepared not for people, but for the devil and his angels. Then why do people go there? Because we commit the same thing that Satan did. Satan, he had his own will and his own way. He said seven times, I will, I will, I will. And he was rebelling against God. God prepared a place of punishment for the devil and all of his angels. That is those demons who were fallen angels. He prepared a place for them. And lo and behold, what do people do? 
All we like sheep have gone astray. We've turned everyone unto his own way. And he still did something about it. The Lord laid on Jesus the sins of us all. And if we will believe and trust in him and let him take our sin, then we can be free from it. It can be propitiated. That means there's an atoning sacrifice, something that covers our sins and an expiation, something that carries our sin away and makes us just in God's sight. It's the death of Jesus Christ on the cross. He died for us in our place. But if we reject it, then not only are we guilty of our original sin and rebellion, but we're also guilty of rejecting the escape. Hell is forever. So I will say this in the passage. I don't believe people in heaven will be able to see people in hell. I get asked that from time to time. The Bible says clearly in Revelation 21, he's going to wipe away every tear from their eye. And I got to tell you, if I could see my friends and loved ones in hell when I was in heaven, I think he's going to wipe away all the memory. The former things are going to be forgotten, the Bible says, and he's going to wipe every tear from our eye. Because if I could see the hurt and pain of those that I loved in hell, heaven would not be pleasant. But he's going to wipe our memory, wipe away tears, and everything is going to be glorious in heaven. Won't it? Amen. Amen. So I don't believe people will be able to see those in hell. Now, this man, this rich man, was not disqualified from heaven because he was rich. This, you read this story and people just immediately, well, the poor man went to heaven and the rich man went to hell and it sure ought to have been that way. Because look how, the, you know, I mean, no, 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 that, that's, we miss it. What does the passage teach? Well, it's a place of conscious torment And when he got to hell, he still wanted his own way. What did he say? He said there, now he cried out and said, Father Abraham, have mercy on me. Send Lazarus. Send Lazarus. He still wants Lazarus to be under him. Send him. Make him come give me some water. And you notice he doesn't talk to Lazarus either. No. He still doesn't say anything to Lazarus. He tells Abraham to send him. Yeah. And send it that he may cool my tongue, for I am in agony in this flame. Now look what Abraham said to him. He wanted his way. He said, send Lazarus. Make him do it. He, look at him. He's got all the blessings. I'm over here suffering. Make him bring me a glass of water. And so this is something that we need to understand. So hell, what are we learning? Hell is a place of interminable reflection. You say, why would you say that? The reflection, the thoughts. The, the, I think one of the worst things in hell is going to be the memory that some people had of having an opportunity to believe on Jesus and to respond to the gospel and asking themselves for eternity, what in the world, why didn't I believe? Watch this. Besides all this, a great gulf is fixed between, uh, 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 between us and you there. A great chasm is fixed in order that those who wish to come over, look at verse 27, Then I beg you, Father, that you send him to my father's house. For I have five brothers, that he may warn them, lest they also come to this place of torment. Now, you can give him credit. He didn't want his brothers to come suffer the same thing he was. Maybe that's true. Verse 29. But Abraham said, they have Moses and the prophets. Let them, your brothers, hear him. Look at verse number 30. But he said, no. Father, Abraham, but if someone goes to them from the dead, they will repent. Now, you may not see this until you think about this. Here on earth or in heaven, our eternal destiny is determined by our relationship to God on earth. He had no relationship with God on earth, and he wants his brothers to hear it. Watch this. He blamed God for his lost condition. What? What? This man who is in hell is blaming God for his lost condition. Why do you say that? This is an attack on God. He said, here's what he is saying. I did not have a fair chance. I had no clear message. I needed a more dramatic proof and witness that just peop- that, than just having people preaching to me and reading the law to me. It's not enough just to preach to me and give me the law. I needed a miracle. 
What is he saying? This is exactly what he's saying. He said, send somebody, send Lazarus, bring Lazarus up from the dead. Let him rise again and heal him and send him to my brother's house. And when they see him rise and risen from the dead, they will believe. Abraham said, no, they won't. He said, they have Moses and the prophets. Let them hear him. They're not going to believe the miracle. You say, well, I don't know about that. You know, there's all kinds of movements today that's called power evangelism. we got to have power evangelism and signs, wonders, and miracles, or people are not going to believe. I'm going to tell you that it's the opposite. If they see signs, wonders, and miracles, they're just going to want more signs, wonders, and miracles. It's never going to cre- create deep-rooted faith. Now, listen to this. At the Exodus, when Israel came out, of the prom- came out of Egypt and went to the promised land, they were miraculously de- delivered from Egypt. They saw God's power in the desert consistently, yet they persisted in unbelief to the point that God says, how long will they refuse to believe in me in spite of all my miraculous signs I have performed among them? He opened the Red Sea. They crossed the Jordan River. He fed them manna in the desert. They got water from the rock over and over and I mean he brought quail into the camp and covered the camp with quail so that they could fill their hunger and what did they do doubt doubt deny not believe. and when he said okay let's go up into the promised land and take it because I'm going to go oh we're scared to death those big people over there we can't take it they didn't believe miracles did not produce faith in the children of Israel even after they crossed the Red Sea Elijah and Elisha performed undeniable miracles, evidential miracles over and over in the northern kingdom, yet they persisted in their rebellion to the point that the whole kingdom went into exile because they never repented. The Lord's miracles, Jesus' miracles, are met by unbelief and blasphemy. They even assign the miracles that Jesus was doing to Beelzebub or the prince of flies, the devil. They said he's doing what he's doing by the devil himself. So miracles, signs, and wonders do not produce faith. Let me go on. The rising, the raising of Lazarus from the dead. Remember that? John chapter 11, verse 45. How did they react? It intensified their antagonism. They all the more wanted to kill Jesus, and they wanted to kill Lazarus too to keep, keep him from telling the story. They didn't believe When the Jewish leaders admit that the apostles have done an outstanding miracle, they intensify their persecution. When the empty tomb was shown, it led them not to believe, but to make up a false story that his disciples came, moved the rock, and stole the body. Miracles did not produce the faith. So this guy, here's what he's saying. I didn't have a fair chance, and my brothers don't have a fair chance. You send some great miracle, and they will believe. And what did... Abraham, what did uh, Jesus say? No. He said, no, they have Abraham, they have Moses, they have the prophets. Let them hear my word. Ah. This is so very important. There are millions today that say the same thing. I'll believe if God makes it clear enough. It's God's fault that, if I, that I don't believe. Show me a burning bush. Part the Red Sea for me and send down some manna. I'll believe. Abraham didn't mince any words. He said, they have Moses, they have the prophets, let them hear him. No, the man said, we want a sign. This man's sin is obvious, and it is not that he was rich. That wasn't what sent him to hell. He neither listened to nor believed the word of God, and he did not repent in response to the word of God. Abraham said, your brothers won't do do it either, not even if somebody raises from the dead. So what are these clear teachings, these clear warnings? There are only two destinies, just two. When people die on planet earth, those that know him and love him and have received the forgiveness for their sins in the person of Jesus Christ and claimed him as their own, they're going to go to heaven. The people who reject that are going to go to hell, one or the other. There's no purgatory There's no reprieve, there's no parole, there is no suspended sentence, none of that. Let me just go on. We have an inescapable responsibility as individual and believers to take God at His Word, not to wait for miraculous confirmation. 
This is what God is saying. Take me at my word. Believe when I am speaking to you. Jesus even said that in the New Testament. He talked about the people that believe because they saw the miracles. He says, well, he says, you know, you have believed because you've seen the bread. You've seen the miracles. Blessed are they whose eyes have not seen but have believed my word. Amen. It's so important for us to understand. So uh, we as uh, believers, or our destiny in eternity is determined by our relationship with God on earth and the decision that we make concerning him and believers have a present responsibility to make it clear to everyone that God has spoken and how has God spoken he's spoken through creation he's spoken through his written word and he has spoken through the living word Jesus that came to die for our sins we have the responsibility to teach and preach that those that receive people can receive forgiveness and can be welcomed into heaven but each one must respond in repentance and faith 2 Timothy 3 says this, You must continue in the things which you have learned and been assured of, knowing from whom you have learned them, and that from childhood you have known the Holy Scriptures, known the Holy Scriptures, which are able to make you wise for salvation through faith, which is in Jesus Christ. And we must trust the truth and the power of God's Word to bring rich people, poor people, old people, sick people, healthy people, young people. It doesn't make any difference. All people are brought to the cross of Christ through the Word of God. And if we're waiting on a miracle, God's not going to send it. Because miracles do not, miracles produce hunger for more miracles. They do not produce faith in those that are watching. You say, well, why did God do miracles? Why did Jesus do miracles? He did miracles to confirm His identity as the Son of God. He did miracles to confirm the truth that was being taught but now we have the full Word of God. We don't have to have the miracles because we have everything God wanted to say. It's right here. Boy, this is a very important lesson. Yes, it is. Hugely important. It's also interesting to note that uh, the story is pretty much directed to the Pharisees. Yep. And uh, I, I like to equate the rich man in this story and his opulence and the gated community to the Pharisees. That's how they lived. Yeah. So when they hear this story, Jesus is describing them. Mm -hmm. And I, I also have a tendency to believe that there would be beggars waiting at their gates sure. to try and get in. So they knew this Lazarus. They knew the yeah, see, I believe That's why I believe this is a true story, because when they said Lazarus, when he said there was a guy, he, he just, I don't know whether he, he didn't name the rich man. He just simply said Lazarus was lay, laying at his gate. I was listening to Martin Lloyd-Jones preach today, and he was happened to be preaching on another subject, but he mentioned this story. And in England, they've actually given this guy a name, Dives, the rich man, Dives. Oh, really? okay. And I never even heard that before. And he kept talking about Dives and Lazarus, Dives and Lazarus. I had to keep listening. And it finally dawned on me what he was talking about. He was talking about this rich man, and Dives meant the men of opulence. It meant the men of opulence. Okay. And, and so here's these, as you say, these rich people in gated communities, and they're just, you know, the only thing that's important to them is their own schedule, their own life, their own lifestyle, their own, and they just, they didn't care anything about this guy. And uh, they thought they had the world by the tail. Come to find out, the Pharisees, they never did believe. Yeah. They were first to vote crucify him. Interesting, huh? We better close this with prayer because this is um, very important. Those of you that are out there listening by Facebook, just bow with us for a moment. And let's pray. And those that are in the room, let's bow and pray. And it's, this, is, this is very serious. I would say before I pray for everybody in here, this, this, is, this makes a heart attack look like a picnic. Because to die without Christ means you go to this place. You go to this place. And then there'll be a great white throne judgment at one point in time when all people in this place are drawn out. And they are judged eternally and then picked up and thrown into the lake of fire forever. So think of your brothers and sisters now while you still can. And friends and associates. And friends. Dear Father, thank you for the time together tonight. And it's, it had, I'm, certainly this lesson isn't intended to just scare people. It's intended to inform people of the truth. But Lord, it is scary. And I pray, Father, that it, first of all, for those that are believers here tonight, I pray that it would draw us 
draw us to the urgency of the gospel message. We can't make people believe. We can't twist people's arms. We can't get them in a headlock and make them do anything. But, oh, God, we can be faithful to keep planting the gospel seed. We can, as Paul did, seek to persuade men lovingly, patiently, tactfully to, to, to persuade people with the gospel to come to faith. Lord, please use us as individuals to do this. And then second of all, Lord, if there's one listening out there, maybe on Facebook or maybe somebody in this room, I pray that right now at this moment in the quietness of the moment that they would, they would not make excuses for their rebellion and sin, not make excuses for rejecting the gospel, but rather just simply say, I am a sinner. I have sinned. I do sin. I cannot help myself from sinning. I pray, Father, that you would lead them to pray something like this. I'm a sinner, Father, and I know it, and I confess it, and I know that you sent your son Jesus to take my place, to pay for my sin, to receive my penalty, to carry away my sin, and to eliminate the impediment between me and my Father in heaven. And God, I pray that you would forgive me. Jesus, I ask you to save me, come into my heart, wash my sins away, let me be part of your family, and thank you so much for dying for me on the cross. I ask this in Jesus' name, amen. amen. Well, thank all of you for the patience tonight. It's a little bit more difficult next week. Got another startling story. Not next week. No, we're not going to do next, next week. Next week. Missions kind of. Don't be gone. There's a lot of good things happening next week. Right here at, uh, at 7 o'clock in the auditorium. Missions conference is in full bloom starting Sunday, but Wednesday there'll be a special service right here, and it'll be great hearing from what God's doing around the world. Let's honor these people that have gone out from us to take the gospel to the ends of the earth. Thanks for being here tonight. God bless you all. You're dismissed. If you have any questions, you can come up. We'll try to answer. Very good.